method of uh, manufacturing carbon fibers, um, what we are going to discuss here is melt spinning or melt extrusion. So this is how the basic setup looks like. So you can see that this is an extrusion process. You know what is an extrusion. Um, you melt a polymer. Hmm. This is typically used for polymers and plastics. You basically melt a polymer and then you give it a certain shape and then you cool it down. That is the extrusion process. Hmm. So you have a certain extruder. Hmm. But the only difference is that if you're making plastic bottles, you have a different kind of mold for it, you, uh, you know, or you're blowing air inside it. You have different types of shapes, you have different, different types of molds. What kind of mold will you have for making fibers? Hmm. So what you need to have is something um, known as this spinneret, hmm, which has nothing but a lot of capillaries. And then your material flows through it and you get fibers. This is the basic uh, principle. And so this is this is a very simple process, right? This is just melt spinning. So this is performed for a number of um, uh, especially petrochemical precursors such as pitches. And you can also use this for melt, use it for melted polymers. OK, so let me just um, detail these steps again. So first of all, what you do is you melt your uh, material, whatever is your polymer or pitch above its glass transition temperature. Now, glass transition temperature is a very important concept. What is um, glass transition? I think we also talked uh, briefly talked about it during uh, photolithography lectures. Glass transition temperature is the temperature below which the material behaves like a glass. Hmm. So above this, the material is sort of melted or it is not. Um, I don't even know melting is the right uh, term that we should use for polymers. It is not. It's a little bit the flow of fluid. Hmm or flow of chains or the molecules of polymers has a slightly different mechanism compared to other, uh, for example, melted metals. Mm. And this um, this is what makes polymers very interesting. So there's entire polymer chemistry, polymer engineering courses. You can learn about the uh, properties of polymers. But there are a few properties that we are definitely going to discuss here because they are important for fiber fabrication. One of them being the glass transition temperature. And the other one is what is known as viscoelasticity and we are going to you know separately learn about these techniques because viscoelasticity becomes important for both um, you know melt spinning and electro spinning so any kind of spinning techniques when you want to pull fibers if you think about it what is the property that you need in any material to be able to pull fibers you need the material to be elastic hmm, to some extent but at the same time um, carbon is hard and brittle but the polymer that we use for spinning they need to be elastic but is it just elasticity or there is something else because we also don't want um, something which has uh, no viscosity whatsoever hmm. for a reason okay so we'll talk about these properties the first thing we do in this setup is we heat the material uh, above its glass transition temperature now that becomes sort of processable material hmm. so now you can process it now you can pull fibers how do you do that you pump from the extruder, you pump this polymer into or pitch into what is known as the um, spin chamber, hmm, which basically removes. So first thing you need to do is you need to uh, remove if there are any particles, hmm, because if you have any particles in the case of fibers, they can be catastrophic. You can, uh, you know, if, if between the fibers, you will get these, you know, bulges because of your crystals and that that might also damage mechanically damage your entire fiber so first thing is that you need to remove if there are any particles now particles that does not necessarily mean that you have impurities sometimes you may also have certain poly, uh, particles of the polymer itself so it is basically the polymer that is still not it, that it still does not have a free flow hmm. so you need to remove those kind of sort of um, you know bigger chunks of material hmm. so you will pass it through some filtration unit and after that what you have is this, um, you know, spinneret, what is known as the spinneret, which is nothing. So I have also shown a, a cross-sectional view of, or the top view of this uh, spinneret. Hmm. What do you have? You have a lot of holes and these holes are basically capillaries. Hmm. Through these capillaries, your, your uh, polymer can, can pass. Hmm. So this is basically the idea. Now you will, of course, have sort of very high chamber so you will have you will collect the fiber somewhere in the bottom uh, this distance is where you also want to cool down your fibers so you what you do is number one you can do um, you know quenching so you can basically um, just cool it down so you may have a cooling chamber what will happen when you cool down the polymer then now it becomes uh, now that temperature is below its uh, um, glass transition temperature so now it will become become hard 
Hmm. And that is what you wanted so that you, you know, once you get the fibers, you don't want them to break further. You don't want them to change their shape further. What you want is you want to, um, you know, make them glass like you want to make them hard. So you can do the quenching or cooling or you can also perform this cooling just by air. So you can, um, you know, blow air that will also help in, you know, it will help your fibers uh, to stay away from each other, not uh, sort of agglomerate or not form one big chunk of uh, polymers. Huh? So this needs to be done uh, very soon after they come out of the extruder so that you know otherwise they will they will stick to each other so you need to basically do quenching or air cooling so in these kind of industrial setups you will typically have a cross flow of the air for cooling the fibers and as you can see at the bottom you have a fiber collection unit and typically you are winding the fibers so you have these fiber winding units and you can immediately as soon as they dry up you can collect them and that is how you uh, you perform the melt spinning process okay now as already i mentioned that this is commonly used for uh, pitch but you also can use it for melted polymers why i'm saying this because there are uh, you will say that polymer should always be melted hmm. when you are uh, performing any spinning uh, yes it should not be but the term melted is not necessarily correct because they can just be solutions Hmm. They are not, uh, you know, melted is something when you melt a solid, but you can also just have solutions that um, are liquid at room temperature. So those kind of polymer solutions, you would rather um, do electro spinning with them rather than um, uh, uh, melt ext extrusion. Melt is specifically for melted polymers. Now, these kind of uh, polymers uh, typically that are fabricated using this process will have their diameters in the micrometer range. You will not get nanofibers using melt uh, spinning. You can imagine that also for making nanofibers or, or very, very thin fibers, you will need to have very small capillaries. And then the surface tension of the capillary becomes very important. You have a viscous liquid and very small capillary, then it becomes very difficult to, um, you know, have very thin diameters. So typically these kind of fibers you will have in the uh, 5 to 10 micrometer range or even a larger. So 5 to 10 micrometer is what you will um, typically get after their carbonization or slightly smaller than that. The shrinkage patterns in the case of fibers are also different from uh, what you have for bulk industrial carbons because there you have much more sh shrinkage due to much more mass loss. Here you will have... Um, you have much more surface area so your defects or byproducts can anneal out easily and you don't get as much shrinkage as you would get for the in the case of uh, of bulk materials and we are going to discuss also why does that happen okay this is a picture of the coal tar pitch i just took it um, you know outside somewhere on a hot day you will see a lot of uh, so just to again give you an idea of what is pitch you know this is this highly viscous material that you get uh, on the roadsides on a hot day it's not very difficult in india to get these kind of pitches it's a beautiful material it's a very high carbon containing material it has this beautiful shine and it has very good viscoelasticity you can already see you touch it and you will know that you can pull fibers out of it so this is one of the most uh, common uh, or one of the oldest carbon uh, precursors in the case of fibers so let us talk a little bit more about um, the uh, a pitch carbon fiber fabrication pitch based carbon fiber fabrication so this is a process flow because this is the industrial process used uh, very commonly that you should know about it isotropic or mesophase pitch you will take any type of uh, of uh, petroleum pitch and then you will perform the extrusion as i have shown previously using this um, uh, spinning setup okay now you have pitch fibers what do you do with pitch fibers do you directly carbonize them now there is one more stabilization step in between hmm. so this stabilization is performed in air for isotropic pitch, you perform it at two, between 200 to 300 degrees and uh, degree centigrade and slightly higher temperatures for mesophase pitch. Stabilization is typically performed to get rid of the organic, the undesired organic material, some of it at least. Huh? And you're performing it in air. That means you are open to burning it, those things out. So any volatile organic materials will typically burn out only the heavier hydrocarbons in those uh, which are high in carbon content. They will stay there. Hmm. So that is why you perform the stabilization. Also, the stabilization uh, step leads to a little bit of cross-linking between your uh, between your uh, heavy hydrocarbon type molecules. So you then get less porosity in your fibers and you get good quality, um, good solid fibers. Hmm. So you need to perform this stabilization of pitch and afterwards you perform your regular heat treatment. Now, when I say regular heat treatment, it depends what is the what is the crystallinity that that you want in your uh, final fibers. So mesophase pitch will give you more like, you know, polycrystalline, almost polycrystalline graphite like fibers. Hmm. But 
although they may have different kind of um, structural arrangements these graphite sheets may not be as nicely you know you don't don't imagine these polycrystalline materials that i have shown that you may you have these random orientation that is a possibility but that is not the only one possible microstructure so we are also going to discuss what are the possible uh, you know uh, ordering what kind of stacking of sheets that you get in these graphitic fibers but that is only from the mesophase pitch you can also get isotropic carbon from isotropic pitch hmm. okay so first you perform the heat treatment um, at relatively low temperatures so between 800 and 1200 and you can actually also stop at that point if that is the desired carbon material no? in some cases industrial applications you don't really care for very high um, you know purity of carbon fibers for example hmm. Now, you can perform the heat treatment further. You can go all the way up to 3000 degrees, as in the case of graphite, and you can get really, really high purity of the fibers. You can also get much higher uh, Young's modulus, good stiffness of the polymers, but uh, of the carbon fibers. But is that what you need? Sometimes it's not the stiffness, but rather the flexibility, rather the tensile strength of the fiber. That becomes more important for you. Purity, how much purity is acceptable to you? Depending upon that, you will also need to see how much cost is going to be increased. Hmm. Because 3000 degree heat temperature is very um, energy consuming. Hmm. So if it is acceptable for you to, uh, to have the fibers um, at slightly lower temperature, you might want to stop there. But if you definitely need very high um, quality carbon fibers, then you will go all the way to 3000 degrees. Again, in similar types of furnaces that you would use for graphite manufacturing. Okay, so this is the process flow of pitch-based fibers. Some important things about pitch is that most of the pitches have uh, their purity between 90 and 95%. A little bit higher can also, is also possible, but most of them have 95, let's say, percent purity. Mm. They have this special property known as the viscoelasticity. As I mentioned before, we are going to dedicate some time uh, on viscoelasticity, but Briefly, the definition of uh, what is viscoelasticity. So, as the name itself suggests, this material has both viscosity and elasticity. Hmm. Elasticity is a property of solid materials. Elasticity means if you you uh, deform the material, it will come back to its normal uh, place as soon as you leave it, like a rubber band. Huh? That is the elastic property. That is a property of solids. Hmm. Viscosity is a property of liquids this is the force this is the resistance to the applied force that a liquid offers so now this polymer type of materials or heavy hydrocarbons uh, uh, like uh, like pitch these materials offer the properties of both solids and liquids so they have both viscosity element and um, and the uh, the elasticity element how is that possible you know that polymers have these long chain like molecules so you have hydrocarbons also in the case of pitches you have hydrocarbons that are chain like molecules or in some cases sheet like molecules now these chains can entangle so they can they they can form these very uh, structures that are very difficult to open so to say they are entangled chain like structures but at the same time they may also have some chains that are floating or that are able to freely flow not all of them but some of them hmm. So you have partially solid-like properties. Similarly, um, in the case of semi-crystalline materials hmm. or in the case of liquid crystal-like materials such as uh, mesophase pitch, what you have is you know that there are certain parts that are crystalline. Hmm. These crystalline parts behave like solids and they can offer elasticity while the liquid-like parts will offer resistance to flow. Hmm. So that is why you have a combination and that combination can, by the way, be um, very complex. Not all polymers will have the same uh, viscoelastic properties because, well, not all, all polymers are semi-crystalline or not, you know, the chain arrangement, the size, the le length of chains in different polymers is different. Hmm. Some of them have very short chains, some have very long chains. So depending upon all of these uh, factors, you will have different viscoelasticities in various polymers, but this viscoelasticity is very important in order to be able to pull fibers out of something because if it is a liquid just a liquid not elastic at all if it if it has only viscosity let's take an example of water difficult to pull water uh, fibers right um, so that we definitely need elasticity hmm. but since it is a liquid we also need some viscosity so we do do need some liquid like properties because if it's a solid material just a crystalline uh, material then also it's not possible to pull fibers out of it so viscoelasticity 
is a very interesting property that pitches have and that uh, a lot of uh, polymers also have and in fact you can also control you can control the ch length of the chains you can also con uh, control how much solvent you have in in a certain uh, polymer solution so based on that you also sort of tune the viscoelasticity a little bit for uh, manufacturing fibers okay now in the case of uh, pitch based uh, fabrication or uh, the melt spinning you would typically also control the viscosity to some extent by the melting temperature because here you are uh, you know that you 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 want to have a certain viscosity in your liquid which is just optimum for gi giving uh, the fibers and also the diameters of the fibers can be controlled by this viscosity so you can imagine that uh, if your material is very, has water like uh, properties then you will not be able to pull fibers but it's slightly thicker than water slightly more viscous than water then you are able to pull fibers but they might be very thin fibers thin fibers how long can they be how long is their aspect ratio what is uh, the possibility there that we need to optimize and then if you have these very um, very viscous fluids like uh, like honey then you can pull fibers but those fibers what is the uh, the minimum diameter you can get from these fibers these are the things that are optimized for uh, for various uh, uh, spun the materials that are being spun okay so in the case of pitch we control it by controlling the chamber temper chamber uh, tem temperature mm. okay and then you as i have already mentioned then you perform the heat treatment um, under inert environment that is done after stabilization step okay you can also if you need uh, certain uh, properties for example if you need very high um, crystallinity in your polymer but you only have isotropic pitch available you could potentially mix a few co particles or even carbon nano material some some sort of uh, carbon nano tubes these kind of additives can be mixed inside your uh, pitches before the fibers are pulled out of it but of course you need to remember that you don't you need to have an optimum concentration of the additive because if it becomes too um, you know it should, and also the size of the additive because you remember that you were filtering out these solid particles hmm. so if you then add bigger solid particles then you will not be able to then it will block the uh, the capillaries hmm. so you need to have only very small additive very this in terms of size but that is also possible okay for all carbon materials this is our golden rule Hmm. higher the heat treatment temperature higher the crystallinity higher the stiffness hmm. and when we say stiffness we are talking about the young's modulus okay so this is also valid for your fibers hmm. and this becomes a very important property in the important uh, of course industrially important because uh, for many applications what you need is good mechanical strength hmm. so that is why for same thing for carbon fibers especially pitch based fibers the higher the heat treatment temperature also that would increase the increase the cost of the fibers so this is basically a direct measure of the quality of your carbon fibers so i told you that the microstructure of pitch based carbon fibers especially mesophase pitch based carbon fibers it's very interesting mesophase is more interesting because we have graphite crystallites so we do not we can have here you see like these what is a six of them possible uh arrangements of these graphite crystallites one of them the third one is the random orientation that is what you would expect from um you know other types of uh, pitches as well so if you have isotropic pitch and you heat it up to 3000 degrees you will get some graphitic content but in that case you know that the graphitic um, crystallites will be randomly oriented hmm. also you will have some non crystalline parts in between them hmm. but if you also have all of these are uh, let's say from mesophase pitch you will get very highly graphitic material you will have very small fraction of non graphitic carbon in that so we can call them graphite fibers in fact this term is also industrially used you will hear the word graphite fibers be careful um, you know sometimes industrial uh, fibers they are not really graphite they are just graphitic but the terminology they call it graphite because that uh, you know um, graphite sounds more sophisticated and also more costly mm. so often uh, the terminology is also used in a in a wrong fashion anyway that is uh, that is not our concern for you it is important to know what is uh, what is graphite mm. so for you it is important to know that um, if you have um, very high crystallinity 
Hmm. Then you can call it graphite fiber, not graphitic fibers. Okay, from mesophase page, when you get the fibers, you can have these various arrangements of the graphite crystallites. Huh? So if you see the cross section, these are the pictures of the cross sections of the fibers. So the first one you can see all these graphite flakes are randomly organized, uh, sorry, radially organized. Hmm. Okay, that these things will, by the way, depend on your, uh, on at what speed, what temperature, what type of pitch you uh, process. So these are dependent on your manufacturing uh, parameters as well as your carbonization parameters. Hmm. So it will depend on what is the heat uh, treatment rate, what is the ramp rate at which you heated these polymers. Hmm. Also, uh, what is the highest temperature, of course. Hmm. Second one you see is this radial kind of, so you have these concentric shell-like structures. Hmm. Okay, uh, concentric cylinders, sorry. So this is the cross section you have. Onion skin is what is the name that is used commercially. But this is the concentric uh, cylinder type structure. Then you, of course, have the random orientation. You can also have these small flakes, but flat, like, you know, on top of each other, they are trying to organize themselves. So they are just flat structure. Then again, you can have radial structure, but folded. So you have graphitic crystallites, but they are highly turbostratic. Turbostratic means they are, um, you know, not completely there it's not an ABABA arrangement so in the case of carbon fibers when we talk about graphite fibers even when we use the term graphite we are not we may not have the perfect ABABA organization here we call a fiber graphite when it has just a very high graphitic content even so you have the large LA value hmm, large crystallite size hmm. LC value is little bit tricky in the case of fibers because you do not have these perfect crystallites so here in the case of random or organization maybe there you can um there you can probably calculate okay this is the uh, you know crystal the, the lc the crystallite uh, the stack thickness but in the case of radial or uh, you know radial folded geometries or morphologies you may not be able to calculate the lc in the same way that you did for other crystallites the point here is the LA value becomes more important and the fact that you have a larger crystallinity and less and less and less very small to negligible basically non-crystalline parts then you will call them graphite fibers okay so these in some cases in many of these cases your stacks your graphite um, sheets may not be perfectly organized on top of each other or maybe you will have the stack thickness but so each of these lines that you see here that is not necessarily one single graphite uh, sheet it may be a small stack of graphite sheets okay but however they have certain curves they are you know they are not perfect as in the case of um, uh, HOPG for example hmm. okay now the last one that you see line origin that is something uh, which you get if your spinneret um, if your you know the the from where your fibers were extruded if that is not perfectly um, circular hmm. so you may also have different shapes of the spinneret and you you sometimes intentionally do that because you want to have, uh, you know, higher surface area. You see, if you have this kind of uh, fiber shape, then you will be able to uh, have more surface area in the fiber. So your uh, uh, byproducts will anneal out more easily. And also for whatever application you're using, maybe this is a better geometry. So also other than these six um, structures, you can also have some other possible morphologies. Of course, if you change the shape of the spinneret, you can make it also flat ribbon like fibers, for example. So there are many such options that are possible. OK, now, um, yeah, so these are some of the things that I have already mentioned. In the case of highly graphitic fibers, you have various possible methods of uh, of or of the fiber of the stack organization. OK, now typically the heat treatment is performed in all cases, industrial cases, you perform the heat treatment at less than five degree centigrade per minute. That is your temperature ramp rate. Hmm, that means how you increase the temperature. OK, and then you will keep keep your material at the final uh, heat treatment temperature for uh, for about at least an hour. You can also do it for several hours because that that also leads to better organization. In the case of fibers, you need to uh, you, you need to understand whether or not uh, high uh, Young's modulus is important. So if you are using these materials for um, making certain structures, manufacturing purposes, often um, you need high stiffness. Hmm. But not all the time. In, let's say if you're making biomedical implants, what you may need is also a little bit of flexibility so that when your tissue is growing on top of that, let's say bone implant, then the tissue is able to press it a little bit. 
Mm. And that is why you may um, may not need very high crystallinity. Mm. But that depends on your application. Even in the case of bone implants, it depends on whether you're making the load bearing joints of your body or other joints of your body, or you're making also a tissue implant, mm. ligament implant or ligament template on which it can grow. Um, so these are certain applications. The point is that um, you need to decide what is the pro what are the properties in your in your uh, fibers that you want, and accordingly you can uh, perform the heat the treatment temperature um, you know at higher ramp rates, lower ramp rates, higher temperature, lower temperature, and so on. Hmm. Okay. So um, yes, you can make fibers in the micro scale. You can make fibers in the nano scale. In the na nano scale fibers, we are going to uh, talk later on. Hmm. In principle. During the heat treatment, you should use slightly lower temperature, as I said, because the byproducts and defects can anneal out more easily. But if it is in the micro scale, still the effect uh, of surface area is not that strong. When you have nano scale fibers, then the surface area effect uh, becomes very strong, especially when you go below the diameters of uh, 50 nanometer diameters. Huh? So if you have a smaller than 50 nanometer polymer fiber, hmm, then the mechanism of carbonization becomes um, slightly different and you may get more graphitization at lower temperatures but in the case of micro scale structures this effect is there but compared to bulk uh, structures but still not so prominent that you can drastically reduce your um, you know uh, heat treatment temperature okay for further reading there are a, a lot of books on carbon fibers huh? and they are very good books very good articles so you can uh, if you just do an internet search you will definitely find um, several books uh, on carbon fibers. I have mentioned a couple of papers also because I, I took some uh, pictures from there and um, I followed this, so the, the, this uh, book called New Carbons and also this uh, uh, paper by Edis. These are the papers that I have utilized. You can, um, there is a lot of reading, uh, further reading uh, about the microstructure of carbon, since, uh, carbon fibers and especially the pitch based carbon fibers. Now in the next couple of lectures we are going to learn about electro spinning and also some properties of, uh, of the polymers that are required for uh, electrospinning.